Well, now we go on to item 4, uh, it's non statutory licensing fees, non statutory licensing fees, and it's a district board by the clerk to license and board. Good morning, everyone. So, the clerk to the licensing board is not here today. She's off on holiday, so she's unable to present this report. But if you have a read through it, it's fairly straightforward and concise. It's just looking to increase the fees that we have currently that we're able to increase, which haven't changed since their introduction in 2009. And the report also seeks to include a fee for Section 50 applications, as they're known, which essentially is a requirement for premises licences. And you will find the Fees are all outlined in Appendix A, which is in four, page 14 of your agenda, which kind of summarises the proposed uplift and highlights at the bottom the fee for the Section 50 application. I'm happy to take any questions. Members, do you have any, any questions in the club? <coughs> so just a couple of just for confirmation, when you said in the report, just to confirm that the new sort of fee structure is the same or comparable with the neighbouring authorities. Okay, in that case, do we know has there been an estimate as to how much the new charging structure might, might raise? Same um, There has, uh, I don't know how to handle this, I think the league has it. Uh, it, it would be vast sums of money. Um, if you look at the, the matters that are increasing, uh, that, like this, as I've been explained, that increase since 2009 when the provision was set, uh, the not matters that we have all applications in relation to. So I would imagine it would be a little more than a couple of thousand pounds of, of income. Um, we, for instance, the Section 50 applications, we probably have no more than two new premises license applications a year uh, that require the Section 50 process. So if we had two, that would be you know, like 900 pounds worth of income generated. Uh, but that's already a matter that costs us significant as a council, uh, not as necessarily as a licensing board. That's already a matter that costs us a significant amount of money to administer. Uh, if I don't have, for instance, carry a site visit for every section of the application, that's the £150 to eat up immediately for, for the environmental health certificate, because it's divided up into three certificates for the environmental health and for the public standards one for planning. The planning one, you know, there's a, there's a plan register search and there's some other searches that need to be done in the background that will undoubtedly and historically have eaten up people that have been worried. So it's not going to be. Uh, by sums of money because we have about two years. The I think probably the the biggest uh, change in terms of where we may see some income generated in terms of recovery. It's not income, it's cost recovery. Uh, I think so the way we would describe it is in the, the variation, the increase in the, in the variation applications. Uh, and again it's only been increased a lot, it seems quite a lot at 25%. It's still pretty close to not making us break even you know, on, in terms of what it costs us to process the variation. There are other authorities who would wind up field that field charge significantly more that we're still charging at an enhanced rate. Um, so I, I don't think it's not going to dig us out of the hole. Every local authority is coming in, that's for sure. But it will certainly help with some of the cost you're coming from us. I'm sorry, I don't have a finger to add that. We has got an estimate uh, <clears throat> that I think she's got a fair number of that's combined with a uh, increase of fees that will affect the license and we'll the license and we'll can approve these fees. Uh, so there's other fees out with the license and board that will be increased and that will be approved by the council. And we have an overall figure in mind about what that will gain. I think across the range of fees, I think she's, she's you know. It's a complete guess, you know, but I think the figure could be around 10,000 pounds as, as an increase in the income. Perfect. But again, it still only gets us to our cost. 
company weapon rather than a European company. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much. Are there any other questions? Do you accept the report? Do you accept the recommendation of the report? Okay. That recommendation being consider the content of the report and advise new fees to continue uh, appendix A and adopt these fees. Okay. Item 5 1 on the agenda to be dealt with on the delegated bill. Now move to item six on your agenda. So item six relates to applications for training funding. We have, I believe, the applicant and his representatives today. We have one specific representative, the uh, applicant, Mr. Peter Croner, and we'll find in your application, or sorry, interjected a copy of the application. You will also find a report from the Licensing and Standards Officer and a response from his colleagues in the form of one application. So I'll hand over to the call to the report. I think, first of all, there's something we should highlight. I think it's been acknowledged that. The, the applicant has already raised a, a discussion with us. There could be a typographical error in the paper part of page 25 that suggests that there's an amendment to the onset license errors from, uh, is, is that what has that been amended? Um, so it's correct in the operating operate plan. plan. It's just an AM. <laughs> Ultimately, they're seeking license errors from 11 o'clock in the morning until midnight. And, and that's what we understand. The, and I, I've treated the application on that basis and not of an AM to lunch time. <laughs> and you'll see in this occasion, oh, I'm sorry. You, you, you'll see in this occasion that my report is fairly uh, short and sweet. I've got no concerns whatsoever in relation to the, the matters that are applied for, the variation that's applied for. Uh, I met with Mr. O'Connor a very interesting tour of the building. Uh, I think interesting is the word I would use. It's quite a fascinating old building. Uh, put my mind at rest on some of the concerns I had prior to discussing the application about the things that have to, you know, perhaps change before certain aspects of the activities could take place. There's still a sloping floor. It's still constructed as if it's a, a bingo hall at the moment with fixed seating on various levels. Uh, but there's plans long term before certain events. Mr. Connor certainly appreciates. That certain changes will have to be made before certain types of the, the activities that are sought in the operating plan can take place. And that's just simply a matter of complying going forward with it, the licensing objectives, in particular the protecting public safety licensing objective. Uh, I was satisfied at the end of the meeting that it was a full grasp of his, his responsibilities under those licensing objectives. Uh, and really wish you any questions. I don't think there's, there's anything to add. I'm satisfied at this time that the, the mandatory license conditions will be adequate to, to manage any events that are planned if we discover that there's events taking place that require some sort of additional license conditions. That's an easy matter to discuss with the applicant. Going forward, uh, I expect that going forward, uh, if the business reopens in the near future and certain types of events will take place, changes will happen naturally to allow the events to take place that maybe will not need any additional conditions. So, um, just would be great in my view, just kind of personal touch to see the building reopened again. It's sad. Large buildings are left uh, closed and, and derelict and end up going to back and round in years to come because we can't get them going. So hopefully we'll be up and running again with some form of entertainment happening in it again in the future. Thank you. Members, are there any comments on this application? Any questions you have to ask for the Either the applicant or the applicant. <coughs> oh. Down, no questions? Okay. 
Yeah. To the applicant, do you have anything to, to say to the committee? Um, I think Elizabeth Stan's officer has explained the bad time quite well and that we are, are actually just trying to give this venue a little bit of flexibility. It's no longer going to be a, a regular dedicated premises, it's going to be more of a multi purpose space. Um, and the changes that we've applied for is really just to reflect that to give them a bit of flexibility to be able to cater for the types of events that people might want to hire the venue for. Um, the aim is to sort of rejuvenate it and uh, Get it activity. Um, I'm happy to, to take any questions on any of the, the changes that we've made, but otherwise, we'll just ask you to grant. Pleasure, Mr. Tan. <coughs> the Elizabeth is standing up, standing up to make a comment there about sloping floor. I think that's uh, a legacy of when the weather floor are very similar, I believe. Uh, that was before my time on this. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I've been in, in the, the venue, I was never a patron of a not, not a bingo, the fanatic, as you know, other people. Um, and it was, it, it just seems to be stuck in the past, the reconstruction within, within the building. And I would like to see uh, something else. I'm mean, absolutely quite excited by what I've read in the report on I said what your intentions are. I know there, there are two entrances, one from Milk Street and the other one of the East Dell, which is almost directly opposite the, this building. Can you tell me which one would be the main entrance into? It would still be uh... And Mill Street would be the, the main entrance, and the other ones would be predominantly fire exits. Okay, Mill Street is going to be the main entrance. Can you foresee any problem with car parking with the patrons not attending the various events? Well, there's plenty of car parking at the back of the building, um, and it's an easy walk around. I think there's only about three or four spaces at the front, and it's a one way system, so uh, I don't think anyone will be parking at the front. Everyone. Should be parking at the back. Um, quite a rarity, it's a free car park at the back. So, um, yeah, that should be very encouraging to park at the back. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? No. Then we're going to ask to either uh, grant the license. Grant the license subject to local conditions or refuse the application. In this, in this uh, instance here, I don't see any reason not to support this application. Do, can I have a second, please? Happy to second, Chair. Councillor Keir? Probably. Members, are we all in agreement? Yes. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you, Ronald. Yes. An interesting one uh, is JD uh, Fuel Hall, and I believe essentially it has been two differences of what we've got under the license, and I'm sure it's going to be what you do. So I'll ask everyone to JD Fuel Hall because the applicant's representative. This is Alan the Bar and Davis, uh, teams, and this application relates to a premises license grant. And the agenda you will find application forms and response from Police Scotland, which means no comment, and a report from the license and standards officer as well. So I'll hand over to Paul just to present the report. Well, if you noticed my previous report was short, you'll notice that this one is even shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, most unusual. Uh, everybody on this occasion will definitely have had time to read and digest the content of that, and it says, uh, as I expected, virtually nothing. The business is uh, just a, a little bit of historical background. Uh, we'll go right back to 2009, put some sort of background to it. The premises traded as a, a bar and night. <coughs> 
uh, where the rear part of the premises was a, was a nightclub, the front part was just a pretty standard vertical drinking establishment, well established in that one, been there for a long time. Uh, we saw the operation of the premises sort of split to a function room and then sort of bar midway through that period and then it was transferred into the hands of the, the well, rating group uh, well, various licenses and allies I'm sure you're aware uh, somewhere around about 2015 2016 somewhere in that area I'm not quite sure uh, and just around about pre-COVID I think would be the term the the, the back half of the premises started to become used as a, as a pool hall and then during the COVID period it became an established second business and it actually separated at some point on the recession hall. Uh, I think in amongst all of what was going on in the world at the time it was sort of looked at the fact that actually probably they really needed to separate the, the licensed operations so we engaged with them on that matter. It has taken some time to sort out because of various things in the background, none of which cause any great concern and it's trading without any difficulty. Probably any, any concerns are brought to my attention about the manner in which it's been trading. So this application really seeks to uh, regulate and identify JJ's pool hall, which is the real part of the premises, the old nightclub, as a standalone licensed unit, which will be managed independently. We'll have a premises manager of its own, we'll have a bar of its own, and we won't be relying, no one will be relying on trading under the license for Pepe's, which is Pepe's bar, which is the front half of the premises. I think probably it's easy for me to mention at this time that there's also an application submitted to vary the license connected with Pepe's, which is very technically a minor variation, one that as soon as JJ's is recognised as an independent premises, the, the Pepe's variation treated as a as a non-minor as a minor variation that can be granted under delegated powers but it's only fair to raise it today in terms of transparency that that premises will now trade as a normal public house uh, used to have a term from a long way in the past uh, but it will trade as a normal vertical drinking establishment a normal bar uh, with the hours reduced to reflect the standard hours that are recognised in bars and hours so, it used to be licensed to, it was previously licensed at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's been brought back uh, by agreement to the stand at 1 o'clock on a Friday and Saturday midnight the rest of the week. Um, in addition, from papers, there was a, a long standing arrangement for children's access into the premises for the purposes of playing pool uh, in recognised pool weeks. That, that term has been removed, children's access, because it's no deemed to be necessarily suitable at this moment in time in terms of the way it trades for children and young persons to access the premises. That's been removed. So we've reached agreement on that between ourselves and the applicant. And, and that, those discussions are part of the reason that this has taken such a, so long to get to uh, a licence award. But where we are today, I have no concerns. The, the operating plan identifies matters that can be adequately dealt with by the mandatory conditions, in my view. Again, once it's traded separately, it will undoubtedly be subject to some compliance visits just to make sure that they're, they're comfortable with what they really need to do as a separate premises. Uh, and I'm sure if there's any issues identified, I've got confidence in the, with the owners, the owners of the license and their, their legal representative. Anyway, we can, we can rectify anything that's maybe not quite right. I don't anticipate coming across anything that isn't right. It seems to be you know, operating as you would expect from a normal sort of pool club, pool bar type of thing where it, where it welcomes people of all different ages and has facilities for youth training, you know, youth engagement and stuff like that. It, was, it all seems quite, quite comfortable, as I say. I think, always for me, the, the background is it's traded successfully for, I think, a couple of years now, maybe, and I'm sure if you know, I'll even tell us exactly how long. It's been trading in this way, but it's certainly been some time uh, uh, without any complaints being brought to my attention. And I've engaged a couple of times with the two guys that, that operate the, the, the different halves of the premises and the CBO you know, work they're doing in terms of managing the business. So, unless you've got any questions, I don't think there's anything. Any questions for Paul? No. I only want just, just for clarification. 
Yes, I think we talked about the, the major variation that's in next item one. The major variation that's in next item on the agenda, but that will be dependent on the result of this item on the agenda. Am I correct? I suppose technically it does because the the application only seeks to uh, vary what would be left of the license premises. You know, uh, if you like, it seeks to remove the. The, 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 the larger area of the vice of the footprint, you know, almost immediately. They, they almost have to happen simultaneously. One couldn't happen without the other because JJ's at the rear of the premises is currently licensed premises. And I suppose technically what can happen is you can't grant a new license to an existing licensed premises. So they almost have to happen simultaneously. I think I think if the license board acknowledge that that's a simultaneous change, that's really helpful in terms of I suppose the very strict legal position of what we have, uh, and uh, I wonder if perhaps I would address you on that very matter as well, in terms of the chronology of what has to happen first. And it's one of these odd chicken and egg situations, what do we, we need to do first? But I think technically we probably have to remove the area from uh, Pepe's so that the bit at the back is no longer licensed premises before we grant a new licensed premises for that. But of course, they wouldn't want that application to be granted unless we're guaranteed that the Pepe, the, the, the JJ's pool ball part of the application was going to be granted. So it almost has to be a simultaneous decision, I think, to keep everybody uh, everybody happy in terms of outcome. Thank you. Is it the mark? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think your analysis was probably um, summed it up um, really well. Um, as he says, we're seeking to separate um, the licence that for premises formerly known as Pepe's Bar and Nightclub into two separate premises. Um, as your analysis has said, um, it was previously uh, one licence back in 2010. Um, there's been a change of operation at the premises and an advice of your analysis. So the licence holder has decided to separate the premises again. Uh, the licence is held by Candle Riggs Inns Limited, but is operated by their tenant, JG Pool, um, and they've been the tenant there since uh, 2021. Um, you'll see from the layout plan in your papers, and your Ellis, who has said as well, it's effectively what was the function suite of the, of the bar that will now operate as this um, pool hall. Um, and the activities on the operating plan are the types of activities you'd expect to see from that type of operation. Um, as you know, also has said, um, the two applications, the next one on your agenda is um, linked to this one. Um, and in that application, that is for premises known as Pepe's Bar. And that is to remove that function suite that we're speaking about for the pool hall from the licence footprint of the um, premises. Um, as you also said, we're varying terminal hours um, to bring that in line with your honours policy. And we are changing children's access so that children are not permitted onto the premises. The licence again is held by Candle Riggs Inns Limited as a landlord. Um, and it is operated by a Vincent Coyle, who has been the tenant since um, 2023, so a little bit more recent. There are no objections or adverse representations um, to either application. Um, and therefore, I'd be obliged if you would grant both applications. Members, do we have any questions? No questions? Questions? Um, sorry, I've just got a few more. I just wondered, I can start on the pool. Is that going to be such a good job to do the person's access? Or is that? Standard thing. Sorry, I, I'm curious to look through the paper so it's a different tweet. But my understanding is the children's access uh, will be retained in the pool. I just don't want to look into that second. Um, the children's access for for the pool hall part, because the children Perfect. will be permitted to the entry to the premises accompanied by an island, and young persons will be permitted unaccompanied to take part in pool with dance matches and children's competition. So children and young persons of all ages will 
the, the JJs, which is no longer going to be permitted to the PEPIS part. But a, a numerical have been, or have been input to PEPIS previously had a table that were part of the local pool week in the back corner of the natural bar. And the devices have been a, a fairly forward thinking step. I think many years ago for women youth pool pools out there on online square those pool matches, not they didn't allow them in their practice or anything like that, but they allowed them in their online square those pool matches. Uh, which was probably a first of this part of the group stopped the film. It was recognised that there are some very talented 16 year old pool players that couldn't go in the pubs to play in pub pool teams, you know, because of the age restrictions. And we, we lived in that as a licence before many, many years ago, now, you know, six or seven years ago, I think. Perhaps earlier. You know, the, the, the position is that children of persons of all ages, not to 17 years, will be permitted. Uh, within the the, the GT's pool hall premises, uh, children will only be permitted on the premises until 9 p.m. Young persons will be permitted uh, until 9 p.m. until the conclusion of a match of competition. So if there's a formal match of the young persons that are 16 and 17, they're about to remain at the end of the competition, even if that means that the competition doesn't finish until the acceptance is that we'll be on to. No matter what circumstances, person under 16 will have to be off the premises by 8 p.m. And I think that's all in line with what the applicant saw. Anyway, and I, I don't want to make it difficult about it because they still, regardless of what license will be grant, they still have the responsibility to ensure that they comply, you know, absolutely with the protecting children and young persons from harm licensing objectives. So they still must have measures in place to ensure that when they have children on the premises, perhaps standards of behaviour of other customers need to be monitored more closely than when there's no children there, you know, in terms of bad language and stuff like that. You know, it's, they should be monitoring that sort of thing anyway, but it has to have greater supervision at the time there's children on the premises. Alcohol consumption and things like that have to be closely monitored and has to be better supervision of where alcohol is being served and, and delivered to in terms of groups that have children and young persons with them. So that, that is still, regardless of what we grant, you know, what you guys grant as a license board, the premises still have that responsibility to operate in accordance with that licensing objective. And failing to do so, I would imagine, would be one of the most serious breaches of a, a licensing objective and, and would be the, the one that would cause some difficulties. There's an easy remedy. You can't look after the children and persons on the, on the premises. You remove that away. You know, the, the application would come before you. Uh, probably we should be at least start and say, actually, just remove the right of children and young persons on the premises. And that solves the problem instantly. And I think we're well aware of that. Those that have the the, the, the privilege of being allowed to have children and persons on non-conventional premises where there's no food offering and things like that. Understand that that is a privilege and understand that the manager, as far as I'm aware, is being properly managed at this moment. And hopefully that will change. Oh. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, it was my it was my error. It was just when I was uh, flipping through, and then I, I think I must have went down to, uh, to the next one. To the next one, and I was that's I was really confused there because I was like, I'm sure it was fine, but no, that's fine. Thank you for the explanation. Do you have any other questions? I will ask the. Uh, Look at this application. The application is for the apprenticeship license grant. Where the board are asked to consider all the information before it and then they determine whether to grant the license, grant the license, subject to local conditions, or refuse the application. I would move that we grant the application. Uh, it has been a well run uh, premise uh, income manager. I certainly haven't come before the, the board for any. Any other means, and uh, I'm quite happy to grant. Uh, I have a second reason. Um, is that grant with conditions, Chair? The standard local conditions? You can grant with the license subject to local conditions, yeah. Um, I'd favour that option. Okay. Can I second that? Yeah, it's important. Thank you. Oh. So I can see clarity because I certainly not made any recommendation in terms of local conditions or mandatory conditions that would be applied to the license. Any that I, my personal view in terms of compliance management is, or I'm not adequate to deal with the changes 
I'm not suggesting that the conditions, of course, it's a different, but those will to add local conditions on a particular time should they, they wish to do so, and they feel that it's necessary and expedient for the purposes of the licensing objectives. If there's conditions that you have in mind, then I'm happy to to uh, assist in the drafting of those conditions if the, if the general nature of those conditions can be explained. I believe we have some standard conditions that we normally apply to, to the licenses. So these are the ones that you have uh, built into your recommendation. Okay. Um, in, in this instance, I've made no reference to uh, pool conditions or the, 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 the local conditions list that we have within our uh, statement of licensing policy. But of course, if the board wishes to add some of those conditions to, uh, or any unique condition that wishes to add on the on the on the board, obviously well within the rights to do so. I just wonder what the nature, what type of conditions in addition to the mandatory conditions uh, the, the board are considering. Because of course there will be a condition there somewhere that, that, that probably covers it if there's something in particular. Yeah, I, Chair, I, I don't want to overly complicate this. It's just a matter of approving. Um, I had assumed that um, given the history that uh, the licence officer had outlined particularly in relation to our innovative approach to pool and following through and council laws comments in terms of the flexibility of allowing uh, young people into licensed premises. I thought that was maybe covered by some form of condition, um, a local condition, but if it's not, as I say, I'm quite happy to approve the application. I just thought that historically there was something in place and therefore it would just um, be aligned with uh, any approval. Oh. Yes, I don't see where from. you from. You're absolutely correct that previously what we have done is applied local condition in relation to the terms for children and persons accessing the local pool match, using the local pool match. In this instance, uh, there's no need for that because it's been written directly into the operating plan by the applicant and it covers exactly the terms which we would normally apply to my conditions with previous applicants, I think previously the premises really indicated that not to 17 year olds would be allowed in certain hours uh, and no real explanation of the purpose. So we covered uh, our back and covered the situation if we wanted to improve my own condition. In this instance, we're in a slightly different situation because the applicants understood our position and has very clearly written the appropriate terms actually into the terms of the license, so there's no need for additional conditions, if that makes sense. And sorry, I didn't pick up that that's what you were referring to, and, and you're absolutely correct. We have previously done that by way of local conditions. So, Chair, apologies, I may have misread that. So, I'm happy to second your straightforward approval uh, based on the meeting with you. Okay. Members, are we again? Done. Agreed. Yep. That's the first part of the application. The second part, as I say, is a, a natural follow-on from the from the previous one. And the, and that is, is a, a variation of the license. Oh. Yeah, I think I've got nothing to add to what I was suggesting during the other one, other than it really must fall, you know, in any case the matter now. I think for formal for formal process and though it would be well done. I don't think there's any need for any further address other than motions to grant the second. Okay. This is held here then to say on, on this matter. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing sometimes. Um no, I don't think I've got anything to add that I, than I previously said. This would effectively be a tidying up exercise to remove the area that you've just granted from the current license of Pepe's. Members, any questions? The other. Yeah. So I'm, I have to check this that because it's not part of the thing for a grant license, but I just noticed that on the new Pepe site out there, there's then no access to a stable toilet. So I just wondered. If there have been any kind of arrangements to help any people that would need access to a disabled toilet? Oh. I, my understanding is that both businesses will still run, you know, 
very much in, in, in tandem. You know, uh, but unfortunately, there's there's no requirement. Uh, you know, going back to when the license was originally granted, my understanding is there's no requirement for an excessive toilet. It's very desirable, of course, it is. But uh, my understanding is there would be no requirement in terms of licensing, you know, legal requirement in terms of licensing for a, an excessive toilet in in the building. Uh, so, but I I am certain that. You know, from what I know of the, of, of the operation, uh, you know, it's it, it it new information to me that Mr. Coyle was involved in, in Pepe's, but I was certainly one of the operations that there would be no difficulty with access to the adjacent, and it, it, it's pretty accessible you know, from, from one premises to the other, from accessible to another adjacent. I don't know anything about the building regulations, but, but the separation of the two businesses happened. Sometime in the formal separation appeared in the assessor's room, there's two separate businesses and the planning consent side of it and the, the you know the, the building standards side of it. So I understand it's all been completed. I'm sure if there's any building regulations issues that I don't get to them. So unfortunately a lot of this could absolutely answer your question. I would imagine that it would be something that they would manage appropriately. Yeah, I noticed from the plan on page 70 that there is a number of the toilet on the uh, pool hall side of things. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. Yeah, no, I know that's why, that's why I asked and I, I checked on the uh, Scottish Government website in regards to the licence and uh, thing. And I know it's not a legal requirement, but it does say that, you know, it would be good to ask those yeah, kind of types exactly. of questions. Absolutely. Members, do you have any other questions? Any comments made on this application? In that case, I move that we accept the variation. Can I second that, please? And I'm happy to second that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the business for us morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Chair.